Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and in today's video we are taking out the world's most beautiful sports car. We're taking out the Jaguar E-Type. It's the Series 1 and it's the 2 Plus 2 model. Now you might know this as well as the Jaguar XKE if you're watching from America, but in today's video we're going to be looking at this beautiful car in great detail with some depth, some history and we're even going to take it out for a test drive in one of the most beautiful places in England which is Bewley in the New Forest. Now I'm going to be showing you a little bit more of the scenery than usual today because for me this is just oh it's gorgeous what a beautiful setting. Now we've actually borrowed this today from BG Giveaways which is down in the New Forest and best of all you can win a chance to drive this completely free of charge. All the details are in the description box below and you can also take it out on hire as well so if you aren't lucky winning it all the details are in there. First of all, I must apologise for where, where we're shooting the walk around footage today. The bank holidays, just like me, are enjoying the new forest, so there's not much open and available space to film the external shots. Now back to the car, because the E-Type isn't just a sports car, it is, according to Enzo Ferrari, the most beautiful car in the world. Now that is a quote that is attributed to Enzo Ferrari. However, whether those words were uttered by him or not, the title has stuck and the E-Type is known worldwide as so much more than just a Jaguar. The story of the E-Type could warrant hours in its own right, so here we touch upon it briefly. There's a great book by Philip Porter called The Most Famous Car in the World. I personally found it hugely helpful in doing research for this video and it's great for additional reading if you feel inclined to do so. The E-Type was born into a world where things were changing. Britain in the 50s was very different to how it is today and it was concentrated on things like rebuilding after the war and the swinging 60s was an entire world away. Cars were finished in muted tones quite often and the arrival of the E-Type was absolutely breathtaking in a way that we just cannot fathom nowadays because I think sometimes we take it for granted that we have access to the internet and you can see anything that's happening in the world in a matter of a few seconds. The E-Type coming in was like nothing else that had really happened before. Now the E-Top was designed by Malcolm Sayer and he'd come from a slightly different background than some of the other car designers that we talk about. He'd been an aircraft engineer in the war and later on he was an automotive aerodynamist. Which meant that he had some great insights from elsewhere when tasked with the body development of the E-Type. It's that curved style which is credited to it to him and whilst the car might have a distinctive styling it's said that this is what contributes to the car's performance. Now when they were designing the car and you talk about what drives people it was a win at Le Mans that was the driving factor for this. However, it was said that the E-Type was actually not only influenced by that win at Le Mans, but partially influenced by the Alfa Romeo Disco Volant. It was their show car of 1952. Now, if you look at photographs of this particular car and you look at the E-Type, you can see where that comes in because reportedly there were photographs of this car in Sayer's office. And actually, when you do put them side by side, you can see that influence coming through. The beautiful head-turning sports car was released at the Geneva Auto Salon in March 1961 and it was the car that everybody wanted to see and everybody wrote about and there were two cars on display for visitors to see. But here's the thing, and you wouldn't have known this if you were just a mere visitor at the time, the second car was ordered so late in the day and so close to the wire, it had to be driven from Coventry to Geneva and it arrived so close to the wire that there was only 20 minutes to spare before the grand unveiling, a cool 700 miles and the car didn't skip a beat. However, it was definitely worth it for Jaguar because 500 of these new E-types were ordered at this show alone. Now at launch, the car was sold with a 265 brake horsepower engine. It was the 3.8 litre engine and it was paired with a four speed manual box. The top speed was quoted as 150 miles per hour and the price for the Roadster was £2,097 and the coupe was £2,196 which was priced well below its competitors that were already on sale and that were being launched at the show. I'll also add in here that one of my favourite bits of trivia I found whilst researching was that Jaguar built the newly built 
used the newly built M1 motorway, which was only a few miles from their Coventry headquarters, as a test track of sorts, and they reached an impressive 120 miles an hour on the motorway. I feel like people always talk about the AC Cobra being tested on the M1, but look, the E-Type beat it to it. It did that as well. Uh, but sadly, due to motorway speed cameras, and also the law, it won't be possible for us to replicate that in 2023. However, being a slightly later car, the car we're testing here today has the 4.2 engine. They fitted that from 1964, and you'll note that it's still down as 265 brake horse, which is the same as that 3.8 they used on the early cars, but the 4.2 comes with more torque. At the same time, they also put synchro across all gears, and in 65 they introduced the 2 plus 2, which is of course the car we're testing out in today. There was the Series 1, the Series 2 and the Series 3 and production ran until 1974 when they finished with that Series 3. So only 15 years in production but let's face it, it's a car that nobody forgets. Now I'm going to show you the inside in a little bit more detail. I try not to get too excited when I get in cars because sometimes that can remove an element of your critical thinking, but it is so hard when you get inside an E-Type. I've wanted to do one of these for years and ever since I watched that episode of Mad Men, and if you haven't, you definitely should, it's where Don and Joan go in to the Jaguar dealership in New York and they see everything for the first time and even Don, who you never see impressed by anything, you can tell that even he's impressed because that's what it's like with an E-Type. It's very hard to imagine in today's world a car hitting down and having the incredible impact that the E-Type did. But when they landed, William Lyons' phone was ringing off the hook. People were saying, I need to get hold of an E-Type. I'll give you whatever you want. But the thing was, they just could not produce them fast enough because to set the cultural landscape for you, after sales tax, they were selling for around £2,200. Cars like, well, cars that are being made by people like Ferrari, Aston Martin, those big big high-end names who are also making luxury sports cars, they were charging a whole lot more. But here Jaguar whisk into the market and they produce the E-Type and it just changes the game completely. So from 1961, the game is set. And even people that don't like cars and don't really know cars, you can show them an E-Type and they know exactly what it is. And it didn't just hit down with Great Britain. Even people like Frank Sinatra had one. They were so cool. So to be sitting here today, it's very hard to keep a cool front on the whole situation. Now, one of the big criticisms I always have when I come into a sports car is that everything feels very cramped. But the thing about the E-Type is, is that they've got it just right. You've got enough space around you to be able to manoeuvre. And you can see here that I can pivot myself around quite easily as I talk to you and I've got enough room. I will say one thing though that if you are a shorter person like myself, although seats are adjustable, I have got an extra bit of seat padding here to push me forward to reach the pedals. So you do need to be on the slightly taller side to perhaps be driving one of these if you haven't got one of these. But the uh, BG giveaways team fitted this on for me because they said how tall are you and I said I'm only five foot three so they put some for me. Now coming inside one of the things that the brochure says is that everything is very clearly labelled and they aren't wrong. So I'm going to show you what we've got. Now first of all if you've ever been in a Jaguar e type early one and you don't remember there being a glove box I believe this was something they put on when they brought the two the 2.2 two or the 2 plus 2 to market. So you've got the lockable front to that. Coming over from there, you've got the heater controls that so just brings it down from cold down to hot. And just below that there, you've got just moving that just changes the airflow up here. And then across the front here, you've got all your gauges and switches. So running from left through to right, you've got your amateur, your fuel gauge, your light switch, you've got your oil pressure gauge and your temperature gauge and then you've got a series of switches. Now I like these because I talk quite often about how things feel either robust or they feel a bit finickety. These are absolutely spot on. So running from left to right once again you've got your interior light, your panel light and we talked about panel lights recently if you watch the Goodness, what was I filming? I was filming the Humber Scepter and we talked about how this is very of its time that you can turn panel lights off and on. You've got your fan switch, you've got your ignition, you've got your cigar lighter, 
just there. Now I believe that came as standard. You've got your push start, you've got your map light. Now the map light has been removed but that switch is still there. You've got your windscreen wipers. Now we'll say that they are two speed, fast and slow and you've got your washer there as well. They're coming in front of us, you've got your choke, and I love this. So quite often when you get into an old car, you'll know that they'll be almost shaped like the cigar lighter and they're a pull. But on this, it's actually a, essentially a flip switch. So it goes from cold to hot into run there as well. So we'll be leaving that on run because we've already been out for a short drive. Coming in front of us here, to your left hand side, you've got your rev counter with your inbuilt clock. Sad times indeed, the clock doesn't work, but goodness me, She's an older lady, I'm not too surprised. And on the right hand side there, you've got your speedo. It runs all the way up to 160 there, but I believe the top speed on your two plus two is I think 139 miles per hour. On your right hand side, you've got just a selection of switches there and you've got your brake fluid and handbrake warning light. So everything's very succinctly put together there. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that the layout is well, it's simply wonderful. Now, a couple of bits that I really particularly like, and it's such a small detail indeed, but I just wanted to show you, was, I don't know if you saw the indicator warning lights there, but I just love it. It's almost like an Art Deco styling. I think that's very nicely put together there. And another thing that I quite like is this armrest here. Now, I was talking recently in a Ford video about how the armrest was positioned so that realistically it wasn't actually very usable if you had your seat pulled right forward. In this, if you see, as I sit down, you've got your armrest and it's perfectly positioned. But I would say that is the case with most things in this car, absolutely perfect positioned in every single way. Now, before I start this lovely car up, it would be rather remiss of me not to mention the fact that the wheelbase has been extended and a couple of other bits as well. Because with this being a two plus two, they've had to jig things around a little bit to cater for these seats in the back. So when they first modeled it out, they thought, well, goodness, we're not gonna be able to just plonk two seats in the back and make that work because there's not gonna be enough leg room. So what they did was they extended the wheelbase by nine inches, bringing the total wheelbase through to, I believe, eight foot nine inches. And what they've then done as well is they've extended the doors. So the doors are extended by eight and a half inches. They've also raised the roof line by two inches and they've extended the glass to compensate with that as well. Now I realise that that means that the design slightly changes from the traditional series one that everybody loves, but Jaguar took a bit of a gamble with this and actually I really admire them because when you've got a car that people have said is absolutely perfect in every way, isn't it such a bold move to go back to the drawing board and say actually we're going to jazz it up a bit to get in what our customer needs because essentially they were looking at every customer they had because whilst you've got I would say the majority of buyers that are looking for just a two-seater the traditional sense you've also got the family man who's very well to do and still wants that e-type experience but also has two kids to think about and this except essentially by extending it that nine inches gives you the essential leg room that you need for children. Realistically trying to get adults in the back is a wee bit of a squeeze and our cameraman today Richard is very generously sitting in the back um, squishing his legs to bits but for children it's absolutely fine. Now by raising the roof line two inches the reason they've done this is is because a it gives you full headroom both front and back and you don't get this in every sports car and it's very much appreciated because if you do have to squish adults in the back of here there is that ability to do so because you've got that full roof line all the way back it also means that they were able to bring these front seats up height wise and what that means then is is the people that are sitting in the back can slot their feet and legs or various bits and pieces under those drivers and passenger seats so all in all, that's a bit, of a, the a bit of theory, a bit of reasoning behind why they've done that. And for me, I think, well, it's a bit controversial thought, but I think I still love the design of it. I still think it's such a beautiful car, even though they've extended it and they've raised the height slightly. Some people are so put off, but trust me, when we go out driving, it's not gonna matter what's going on up here because when you're sitting in this driving seat, and you're hearing that engine purr away, 
You're not going to worry about that. Now have a listen. So we've got that 4.2. It's 265 brake cores. Now, with all the extra weight that comes with it, things like that glove box lid right through to the seats and all the extra bits and pieces because we've extended everything, we've raised the roof line, your 0 to 60 is slightly extended. So I believe it comes up 0 to 60 is 7.4 seconds on this. So have a listen anyway. I'm so excited for you to hear. Now, I will tell you, it does have a pre-engaged starter, and that's great because on really cold mornings, it'll mean it'll start with far more ease. But have a listen. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a rev so you can hear it. The whole car gently just shakes you about. It's probably one of the most erotic driving experiences I have ever had in my entire life. But first of all, before we take you out for a drive, let's go to the back. Have a listen from the outside as well. Right, come on, let's go on an adventure. And the thing that I was going to tell you is, is your biggest hazard in the new forest is that animals retain the right to roam. So you see all sorts, you see cows, you see pigs, and now we're seeing some horses. And the funniest thing is, they're not even frightened of the cars. So they just stand there quite lazily and don't move across. So you have to be very careful when you're driving through so as to watch out for all the animals. You also have to watch out for holiday makers as well. They just seem to plonk cars here, there and everywhere or come to emergency stops when they see animals. It's just driving with a little bit more consideration. But anyway, talking about driving, let's talk about driving this E-Type because this is not really like anything else I've experienced. It is a driving class all of its own. And the first thing that grabs you when you get in, I think, is how light the steering is. Now I thought it was going to be, if I'm honest, quite heavy and I thought mm, probably going to need the arm muscles today. Not so, it's actually incredibly light and also incredibly responsive in a way that I think you really have to treat the car with some respect because if you put too much gusto into the steering I think you could end up on the other side of the road without too much hassle, especially if you're used to um, older steering setups like I am. We've got rack and pinion steering on this, I should probably let you know. But look, even as we come through and we're driving at low speeds, and even when you're at the very low speeds, when you're trying to turn and maneuver around into a parking space, it's still a lot lighter than you may anticipate. In fact, a lot lighter than that Triumph 2000 that we took out recently. Now in terms of your turning circle on this, I read two different numbers, so I'm going to give you them both. So in Auto Cars Test of the 2 Plus 2 in June 1966, they quoted it as 41 feet, but in a brochure I was looking at, it said 45 feet. So anyway, it's somewhere, it's either 41 or 45, but it's quite a considerable turning circle, which of course is partially because of that front end as well. Now you might be wondering, if you watching the channel for quite a number of years you'll remember years ago I took out something with quite a long front end and said it was made for quite an intimidating drive and you couldn't really feel where the end of the car was I know I don't know if it's because this is a 2 plus 2 and the seats are raised or whether it's something that is typical for an e-type of this era but I can actually see to the end of the bonnet quite easily and I thought when I first saw the car that I was going to be quite intimidated driving it and I wouldn't be able to fully gauge how big the vehicle was whilst driving. But not so, because I've actually got incredibly good visibility. I can see to the end of the bonnet and it gives me confidence in absolute buckets. It's fantastic. Now as we cruise along, 
about to see another horse just there. This is truly one of the most pleasurable driving experiences I've had in quite some time. There's bits that I would maybe change. The gearbox is quite notchy. I was rather spoiled the other day when I went out in that Humber Scepter and uh, the gearbox was just so light and breezy that everything else in comparison feels like quite a chore. But really that's my only thing that I would perhaps change a wee bit. Everything else about this is absolutely delightful. And as you cruise along, just it's the whole experience that I don't think you can quite get, maybe watching the video at home, but it's the sumptuous seating, it's the feel of that steering wheel in your hands as you cruise along. It's even down to the colour of the vehicle. Everything about this culminates in just one of the most luxurious and pleasing driving experiences that I've had for a number of years. Now, as you see, our uh, drive is being uh, inhibited somewhat by these donkeys. I'm just gonna... Are they gonna move? No, don't pet them, they'll bite you. That is one of the things I would say if you are visiting this area, don't feed the animals, don't pet the animals. They are essentially wild animals, they're not pets. But you can see all the bank holiday traffic here. It's quite busy at the moment, but it's not really holding us back. Now, one of the things that Autocar said in June 1966 was even though we had a blanket 70 mile an hour speed limit across the UK, there wasn't really anywhere that you could drive any faster. It didn't take away from the driving pleasure. And with the auto car team, I would agree wholeheartedly because even though I'm being held back today by wild animals and tourist traffic, it doesn't take away from any of the excitement or the joy. Because look, you put your foot down, you hear that 4.2 roar. Even though we're having to hold ourselves back oh so slightly, it's still an incredibly breathtaking experience. And I wish that you were sitting here with me because even the smell of those sumptuous leather seats, the roar of the engine, everything comes to life in a way that I've never felt in a Jaguar before, but I completely get the magic now. I've never really fully understood the love for E-types, not until today. And I don't think you fully can until you've driven one either. So I guess that leaves me on the note of saying that you can win a driving experience in this completely free of charge. All the details are in the description box below. The experience to win is provided by BG Giveaways. And don't forget that you can also go on to New Forest Classic Car Hire and you can hire it out as well. And it's not just by the hour, you can hire it for the weekend. And I tell you what, I have definitely considered it because this is just absolutely glorious. But until next Sunday, when we're back once again having a look at another car from BG Giveaways, take care and drive safely.